So I didn't know that you race cars so much. Oh, I did. So let's start there. All right. All right. You, when did you get your first race car? How old were you? Oh, I was in my 20s, late 20s, when I got my first one. It was a great car. It came with a spare tire. I paid $225 for it. It was a 1953 Studebaker with a 1953 Studebaker engine in it, but it had a roll cage. So I was all set and ready to rock and roll. And uh, off I went in 1966 to Stafford on the dirt. Yeah. You were how old? I was in my 20s at that point. So I, that the, and that seems late to people today that it's not that was Well, I I didn't have the money for a race car. Yeah. Who's going to put somebody that never drove a race car in a race car? So I knew I had to have enough money to buy one. And 220 was about what I could afford at that mm -hmm. point in time. And uh I didn't have a trailer, I didn't have a tow rig, but we managed to get all that stuff together and off I went. I raced it for a year at Lebanon Valley Speedway when they paved Stafford. I, well, I wanted to race on dirt, so I didn't want to race on pavement at Stafford Springs. So I went to Lebanon Valley, and uh, there was a night there where I was in the consolation race. I was starting 25th, and they were going to take two cars and move them to the <laughs> feature. And I'm sitting behind the wheel, and I'm thinking, this is not working well at all. And uh, so we decided to build an asphalt car. And Who's we? we? Built, uh, Wally Pettengill was the guy that was taking care of my stuff for me at that time. I was still in graduate school at that time. So uh, he built a, a late model for me. We went racing at Stafford Speedway, uh, and then uh, we went from a Ford to a Chevy. Uh, and then from there, uh, I went to having to finish up my Ph.D., and I just I didn't have the time nor the money. So I wound up having to basically park it uh, for a couple of years. And uh, it was so nice to get back. You know, it, it, there's just nothing better than sitting behind the wheel of a race car and you hear the motor and you feel the tires and you just, in, it's such an enjoyable experience. So you got a PhD. Yeah. In what? Psychology. Why did you do that? Because every step of the way in my education, all I had to do was to get a little more educated and I could get a much better paying job. <laughs> that meant better motors, more tires, and all the stuff that you need to go race. How have you used your psychology PhD in racing? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, the, what, the thing, did you, what were you planning on using that PhD for? I wasn't sure what I was going to do uh, because there were a lot of choices at that point. Uh, I wound up as a college professor, uh, that, which was, yeah, that was good. Nine uh, years. Yeah, and, and what it did, I had summers off. Well, how perfect can it be? You've got summers off. It's May, and that's when racing starts, so off I went. When you're a college professor for nine years, like, when did you start teaching college? What, how old were you? Oh. Young? Early 30s. Yeah. Early 30s. Yeah, early 30s. Yeah. So, gosh. So, d and you're racing, you're driving in the summers? Yeah. And you're, what are your... What do your students think about that? Are they like, it's not what my students thought about it. It's what the president of the college thought about it. What did he think it. about it? It wasn't a he, it was a she. Oh. I was teaching at an all-women's Catholic college. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And there was a point in time where I was trying to run two different cars simultaneously. This is for a guy that's running on a shoestring, okay? So I had a dirt track center steer modified, one of those big block ugly things, and I also had a sprint car. And I only had one tow rig, so I had to borrow tow rigs, and I had friends show up. But one Monday morning, I get up, and I look in my driveway, and the only thing that's sitting there is the ramp truck with the sprint car on the back of it with my name on it. I think, well, I've got to get to school to teach today somehow, so I guess that's what I'm going to do. So I drove the ramp truck with the race car to the college and parked it in the faculty parking lot. <laughs> Ten minutes did. later, here comes the P.A., Dr. Bergerin, report to the president's office now. So I get down there, and she was a nun, and she said, what is that thing in the parking lot with your name on it? I said, well, sister, uh, that's a Don Edmonds sprint car. I don't care what it is. She said, get it out of here. I said, well, uh, everything I have in the world is in that car. I, I, I can't just park it on the streets of Boston. She said, you take it wherever you want. I want that car out of here. So I wound up getting in the truck, and I parked it behind the cafeteria where it couldn't be seen. But I knew that was the end of my teaching experience, that she was not going to bring me back the next year. Really? Yeah. Why? So yeah. explain that. 
Because that doesn't. I just it didn't fit. I didn't. I didn't fit being a college professor at an all women's Catholic college. As simple as that. Not somebody that but gets this is money. Nine on years. Amazing. I <laughs> I did that. Uh, just because I, I thought they were going to throw me out long before that. I mean, they knew that I was racing, and they didn't like it. It just, it just wasn't the right thing to be doing. That, and you say that because so when we are doing, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I probably knew some of this before that, but when we started doing Lost Speedways in our first season, yeah. I learned about these tracks having so much difficulty with the communities. Yeah. And a lot of the community leaders in some of these areas want to shut down racing at these racetracks and wanting to get rid of the track. Like not, the, tr the tracks weren't seen and racing wasn't seen as a boost for the community. It was seen as a place where bad people hung out. That's right. Yeah, bad guys. Yeah. Is, well, that, is that kind of the same vibe that? Yeah. Uh, well, when I grew up, I, I'll never forget my dad. Uh, when I started spending a lot of time hanging around the race car shops, he said, those are bad people. <laughs> you keep hanging around people like that, uh, not, you're not going to wind up doing anything worthwhile in your entire life. That racing stuff, I, I, you can enjoy it, but just don't get close to it. That's so wild to me to think that people thought, you know, even like your parents or... or, or like racing's bad. Yeah, bad people that race are bad. That's right. They're not good. You know. Yeah. I can't even think. I can't even imagine like a you know the that they're being sort of it being taboo. You know. But that was a long, long oh, time I know. ago. You know, I graduated from high school in 1960. Yeah. So you're, it's you're, not that long ago. Well, it is in my life percentage yeah. wise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but things have changed. Yeah. I, I think at this point. If I was racing and also uh, teaching at the college level, I think it would be accepted. Yeah, well, of course, right? That's what's so. That's why it's so strange to me because you're saying, "Hey, man, I parked it in faculty park." I think it'd be a joke in the break room, right? Yeah. Hey, you got your race car out there? That's hilarious. Yeah. And yeah. the kids might be like, "Oh man, that's neat." <laughs> maybe not amongst the nuns. It wasn't so funny. <laughs> Even though maybe I would, I would say that the nuns today would would joke around in the break room about it. Maybe. But back I don't know. then, it was like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't bring that back, and you might not have a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's where it was going for right. sure. So, did you, you? So you were sure in that you were sure about the the fact that you were probably going to find something else to do. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it, what were your options? Um, I didn't have very many. Uh, I mean, I was a I was a psychologist, and uh, there weren't a lot of things other than teaching you could do at that point because in graduate school I went kind of away from the clinical stuff more in the direction of experimental psychology, particularly experimental social psychology. What's that mean? Well, basically how do groups work? How do people interact with each other? Uh, how can that become more effective? And, and, and where are the mistakes as, as people interact with each other? Uh, a lot of that kind of thing. But I had another opportunity. I had tried for years to get the job as the editor of Stock Car Racing Magazine. <laughs> and there was one day when I, I was just so fed up with the college thing and the way they were treating me and just I, I felt like such an outcast and my phone rang and it was a guy named Monk Reynolds and he said hi I got a deal for you I need an editor for Stock Car Racing Magazine and I need him in two weeks and you're the only person we know <laughs> that knows anything about racing and who can type <laughs> I said well I got a problem I've already signed a contract to teach one more year and I said I, I, I gotta kind of got to do that he said, how much are they going to pay you? And I told him. He said, if you're here in, in uh, North Carolina or in, in Virginia, in two weeks, I'm going to double your salary. I said, you just hired a, an editor. <laughs> and that's what happened. So I started as the editor of Stock Car Racing Magazine in the late 1970s, around 1978. Really? Yeah. So <clears throat> I, spent, um, I spent the last several years... Um, collecting stock car racing magazine mm. every issue, and I have them. Good, I have them all from Good. from start to finish. Uh, I believe it started in '66. You're right, and it was not monthly. It was maybe every other month. Yeah, and um, after a couple years, it started to pick up steam. And uh, to me, you know, that magazine and that magazine and to an extent, Circle Track were. The magazines. Did you, I guess probably not right out of the gate, but did you realize, like, that was kind of our Bible or, or that, you know, Winston Cup scene was kind of doing its thing uh, or the Grand National scene or whatever it was called back then. 
Stock Car Racing magazine was kind of the the that was the top of the mountain, right? That was the only thing yeah. that was really telling the story about what was going on in this little bubbling sort of f- sport that was going to explode. Um, <laughs> did you sense uh, what kind of important role you were playing at that time? Well, what I sensed was the role that I had to play that was most important was keeping the thing alive. Right. Uh, it wasn't drawing much advertising at all. The expenses were high. Uh, and uh, some of the people that were there had their hands uh, on the money that was coming in and putting it in their own pocket rather than putting it into the business. Mm -hmm. So I was there two weeks. I'd given up my job. I'd moved out of my home, left my wife behind in the house that we owned. That is like synonymous, uh, or that is so common in people that sit in that chair. Really? I left and my wife in another state. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) it makes it... it, it's a racing story, right. in other we, words. We, yeah, it is. we eventually, you know, got back together in the yeah. same house, but for a period of time, we were living in two different places. Like, yeah. that blows my mind. So I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Here I am in, in Virginia, for crying out loud, and and I've got an apartment that I've rented. I've signed a contract. I've paid for it, but I got no job. Now what? So what we wound up doing, they all wanted us to move to New York City, well, that's not a good place for an auto racing magazine. It's definitely not a good place for Dick Bergeron. Mm-hmm. So uh, we all just basically said, we're not doing that. And they gave up on trying to move us. And they said, well, you're going to have to turn this thing around somehow or another. And the way we turned it around was we started realizing that the majority of people who were reading the magazine were people who were involved in local Saturday night short track racing. And they had to buy brakes and gears and pieces and parts and all the rest of that. So I started, in, in what should have been my spare time, I started going out selling advertising. Terrible conflict of interest to be the editor of a magazine and the only ad salesperson. But that's what I was doing. And I was able to bring it in. And uh, by bringing in the advertising, all of a sudden now we had enough money that the magazine looked like it was going to not only survive, but it was going to thrive. And it did. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was a wonderful job. Uh, nobody told me where to go and what to do. All they cared about in the company was how much money are you going to make? And I found that the more deeply involved I got in the sport with the stuff that was printed and the stuff that I did and the stuff I was involved with, the better it worked. What a job for a guy that loved automobile racing. The deeper you go, the better things work. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a wonderful job. You want to hear the rest of that conversation with Dick Bergeron? Well, you got to listen to all of the podcasts. The Dale Jr. Download, available on all major podcast platforms.